for that lovely introduction. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Thank you to the Center for South Asia for inviting me to give this lecture. Thank you for all the folks who arranged um, this event. Uh, Shatun Jay, who's with us behind the screen, and also Tyler, uh, and of course, Mo Banerjee, who I think initiated the visit. I'm sorry I can't be with you there in person. Um, but I'm relieved we didn't make travel plans amid what's going on right now. Um, I do want to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, as you can see from behind me, I'm speaking today from Cornell University, which is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayakono. The Gayakono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. I acknowledge the painful history of Gayakono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayakono people past and present to these lands and waters. And with that introduction, I do want to start by sharing my screen and I'll share a number of images with you. If I haven't put an attribution on it, it means it's, um, uh, it's available. <coughs> on Wikimedia. So I'll start today's uh, conversation by making a couple of confessions. So the first is that this paper is not much like anything else I've written or researched. It focuses around the deeds and words of a quote unquote great man. It also focuses on the history of art, the politics of preservation, and the practice of monumentalizing. None of these are topics that I trained in, but they inform the new book project that I'm working on. The city of Calcutta, which was the capital of British India until 1911, is often known as the city of palaces because of the many white buildings that were installed along the main street Chorangi in the, in the 18th and 19th centuries. I would argue it's also a city of monuments filled with statues that decorate many of the public spaces of the city. <coughs> a component of this project focuses on monuments that were installed in the city after 1947, after India gained its independence from the British. And I intend to focus on figurative statues of freedom fighters and nationalist heroes. The talk today is a chapter that I think will go in the middle of the book and form a kind of hinge to everything that comes before 1900 and forecast a little bit of what comes after 1947. So when I began the research a few years ago, I began um, by thinking of the installation of this statue on the left. Oh. And in case you can't see the inscription, um, it's a statue of Kudiram Bose. Um, he is the figure who's represented on the cover of my recent book, Gentlemanly Terrorists. The Kudiram statue is mounted on a tall plinth um, and it has a kind of inscription in Bengali and English on the bottom, which I won't go into. But what I discovered in my initial research is that the plinth was originally holding up a statue of Lord Auckland, who had been the governor general of Bengal in the 1820s and 30s. In the process of excavating the history behind this statue, I began to think more seriously about other statues in the city. When the pandemic hit, like many of us, I found myself stranded. Without travel to archives, I turned to drafting a chapter based on materials I'd already collected and drawing from digital materials that were widely available on the internet. And so what I wanna make clear today is that much of what I talk about today are based on materials available through various digital resources, the Royal Collections, Happy Trust, the Internet Archive and other sources. The printed materials are actually all available here in Ithaca at the Cornell University Library. Um, this is all my way of saying Curzon and this subject is not the figure I would have chosen to work on, but it turns out that he's a very easy figure to work with. He wrote a lot, nearly all of it was curated and printed for the use of researchers, and he was prodigiously invested in making his views known. I had also not intended to write about the Victoria Memorial, it looms um, very large in the city of Calcutta and people have very strong opinions and I'm by no means an expert. 
but I became interested in the building when I discovered two features that are important to the larger project. Um, many of the sculptures, and this is a very old photograph, are replicas of statues that appear elsewhere, most notably London. And I've pointed out on this picture the two images, uh, the two statues that are replicated elsewhere. I'm happy to talk about them. Won't focus on it today, but I do want to say that the replications are important to the book project. Through these versions of the same figure, I see a curated effort to spatially and visually tie the cities of the empire together into a shared aesthetic. Today, I wanna to turn to another theme of the project, which are informed by the controversies that surround the removal of statues to colonial figures. And I wanna talk more about the tension between those who wish to preserve history and those who are seeking to erase it, so-called erase it. I'd like to intervene in these conversations by making two arguments. And so the first one is that history was actively being staged and shaped through the installation of statues. Statues do not commemorate history so much as they promote and advocate for a particular version of history. In the British Empire, these monuments were often installed many years after the event, strategically solidifying the empire in bronze, marble, or stone when there were protests against the continued occupation of India. Second, we often imagine, which I'm going to turn back, second, we often imagine that things are old and that when they're old and historic, they should be preserved. And it's an idea that I want to investigate a little bit more critically. Today, I'll trace the evolution of that idea to the 19th century, when the archeological urge to excavate partnered with the historical urge to document and stabilize a particular colonial account of history. For both of these arguments, Curzon is a figure who condenses these historical developments. Curzon's preservation projects were an attempt to document the history of the empire at a moment when the empire's goals were being actively challenged. Curzon also became deeply involved in archeology span or rather the preservation of India's ancient ruins at the same time as he promoted the telling of India's modern history. In order to show you how I came to these arguments, I'll start with the speech that Curzon gave in the month after Victoria died. Here, addressing members of the Asiatic Society of Bengal in February 1901, Curzon, then Viceroy of India, and you can see a postcard of him on the left, announced the construction of a monumental building in honor of the recently deceased queen that would serve as a quote unquote historical museum. In contrast to history that was conveyed through written texts, Curzon proposed an innovative type of historical record. This historical museum would be visible to the public rather than kept out of sight in libraries and archives. It would display history to the public through the exhibition of objects, maps, objects such as maps, coins, armor, paintings, and most importantly, statues. He hoped that Victoria Memorial Hall would showcase, quote, showcase a representative and historic exhibition illustrating the wonderful pages of Indian and Anglo-Indian history. And I've put in a few more quotes from that speech because I'm not gonna read them all out. Even as Curzon explained what a historical museum included, he clarified that the Victoria Memorial would not be, quote, a museum of antiquities filled with undeciphered inscriptions and bronze idols and crumbling stones. This distinction between the crumbling stones of antiquity and the wonderful pages of history ref reflects the development of these two intellectual genealogies, archeology span and history. As these two fields became professionalized into academic disciplines in Anglo-American universities, archeologists and historians developed protocols for how knowledge about the past was produced. In very simple terms, and this is about as simple as I can get, archeologists focused on the study of unique materials and objects that were situated where they were located, while historians focused on texts of historical importance that were reproduced and circulated. Archaeological excavations, which were aimed at the discovery, classification, and restoration of ancient objects, monuments, and ruins animated the longstanding value of a classical education. Joining the study of classics in the form of studying ancient texts in Greek and Latin with the study of ancient ruins generated the founding of the field known as classical archaeology. This was a field that is central to the colonialism of Western Europe because it linked the ancestry of Western Europe to classical foundations that predated the establishment of other civilizations. 
for instance, in Asia. The discovery of Pompeii in the middle of the 18th century by a British surveyor began a long process of finding material evidence of Britain's Roman, Roman past and claiming that it was older and therefore more advanced than other civilizations. Dating the ancient was central to mapping who was more advanced and Curzon was central to, to arguing that the discovery of these ancient ruins in India showed in fact that Britain was more advanced. In colonial India, scholars have long shown historical narratives written by British observers were ways to rationalize the British occupation of India as a form of restoration to a timeline of liberal progress. And probably many of you know the texts um, that I'm thinking of, Partha Chatterjee, Manan Ahmed's book, um, Priyasatya. As historical writing became professionalized, becoming an academic discipline that emphasized putatively scientific and objective methods of obtaining knowledge, collecting and preserving historical materials became very important. What emerges at this moment is also a new form of commemorating history, and that is called statue mania. Statue mania allowed non-professionals or amateurs to promote what they thought was important about history. And so commemorative monuments carefully situated in public places represented historical figures and provided a narrative that was available to many more than those who could actually, who would actually read a study full of books, as Curzon said. Contrary to Curzon's vision that commemorative monuments like the Victoria Memorial were called and displayed history, this article argues that statues and monuments were mobilized when the history of empire was being contested. Curzon and his ilk consolidated a version of history that drew from ancient and classical forms, making it seem as if these statues had always been there. In other words, the installation of commemorative monuments confirmed the empire's permanence when the empire was most at risk. I wanna quickly show you, um, I think I can show you the next uh, slide. Ah, oh, looks like it's frozen. See if I can do this. <clears throat> I want to just share with you um, a slide by that kind of specifies something that I'm thinking about by Alois Regal, who is uh, a scholar of art history, maybe the founder of the modern discipline of art history. And his arguments about the modern cult of monuments and the different values attached. Regal, Regal specified that a growing commitment to preservation invested many objects, even those that were dilapidated with new meanings. And what he noted that as the 19th century ended, the conceit of the modern era was that all types of historical evidence, old or not, were to be maintained, restored, archived, rather than lost to the past. In other words, Regardless of their art value or their historical value, Regal argued, or sorry, in regardless of their art value or their use value, Regal argued that all old objects come to have historical value and therefore should be preserved. He noted that monuments in particular, quote, with intentional commemorative value, aim to preserve a moment in which the consciousness of later generations had to remain alive and present in perpetuity, close quote. In Regal's arguments, which are roughly contemporaneous with Curzon's speech of the Victoria Memorial, one could see how the collection of historical portraits and statues in a building that looked classical but was brand new embodied the modern embrace for monuments. It expressed by commemorative value, which seemed as if it were marking the past, was a way to imagine the future. I'll just say very quickly about statue mania. Um, one of the arguments of the book, and I can talk more about it in the Q&A, is that statue mania is actually relatively recent, particularly in the case of Britain and its empire. Um, there's a real rise of it uh, under the East India Company. It really expands into the public after the Napoleonic Wars and the building of Trafalgar Square. Um, <clears throat> and then it really, really flourishes around the death of Victoria. And so this is the component I'll talk about today. By the beginning of the First World War, that mania for monuments really um, for lack of a better word, dies down. And, and in part, it is because people are uncomfortable with the idea of promoting the great man of history. When Curzon promoted building the Victoria Memorial Hall in Calcutta, 
he reminded his mostly British audience that Trafalgar Square in London had been uh, a very important feature of public monument and statue building in the metropole. He noted, quote, more good has been done in arousing public interest in the Navy in England by the spectacle of the heroic figure of Nelson standing on the summit of a great column in Trafalgar Square and naming hospitals or ships. And here he's contesting the idea that spending the amount of money on the Victoria Memorial that was spent in the early uh, 2000, in the early part of the 20th century was a mistake given a time of famine. What Curzon says is actually look at how important um, buildings like Trafalgar Square have been. This uh, is the slide that was on the poster and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. This is the slide of the opening of the Victoria Memorial. You can see here that Curzon's historical museum in Calcutta became a site where statues were gathered in the garden, new statues were commissioned and busts were commissioned by members of the East India Company were collected from various sites in Calcutta. Calcutta's Town Hall, the Government House, the Asiatic Society, and the Dalhousie Institute. The goal from Curzon's perspective was that the public could more easily see the progression of Britain's history in India if they were displayed in a public museum rather than in the confines of spaces that were limited to members or residents. And here, Curzon imagined that this would function as a museum that would inform British visitors about this history, but also Indian visitors and tourists. This essay turns to the 20th century, this moment when Curzon decided to bring together old artifacts with new artifacts to show them in this memorial hall. One of the disjunctures in Curzon's historical imaginary was that while he was Viceroy of India, he faced various challenges. He came to India after several decades of famine. He had to persuade Indian leaders that Britain's continued involvement was beneficial for India. When he resigned as Viceroy in 1905, he left amid the unrest that was unleashed by the partitioning of Bengal, the largest of the British dominions. At that moment, the foundations of the Victoria Memorial were just being laid. As you can see from this image, which are taken from the album, the photo albums of the Royal Tour in 1921-22, the foundations from the Victoria Memorial were only being laid in 1921, 15 years after Curzon left Calcutta. In 1921, probably many of you who are historians also know that the non-cooperation campaigns were raging and the Prince of Wales arrived to distract the Indian masses with a royal tour. And of course, here you see the, some of the pageantry that involved this tour. The way that I've set up this timeline of Curzon's campaigns to monument, monumentalize the British Empire as it was being protested. So remember in 1905, there are the Swadeshi campaigns when the building finally opens, coincides with the non-cooperation uh, non um, movement. This is the temporal disjuncture that I wanna to intend to. And so I wanna make clear that I think the permanence of monuments are intended to outlast anti-colonial protests, something that I think Curzon was deeply aware of. I'll end by talking a little bit about how archaeology and history fit together. Um, but one of the things I want to make clear is that not all old monuments are the same uh, in this story. Person's ideas about a memorial to Queen Victoria drew from his strong conviction that visually displaying the history of India could educate not just British people, but also Indians. As one art historian has noted, Curzon, quote, conceived the memorial as a physical embodiment of a history lesson. The idea that material items such as monuments could tell the history of a nation or empire persisted in his thinking. He argued much the same when he returned to Britain after his term as viceroy. And he wrote, quote, monuments are documents just as valuable in reading the records of the past as is any manuscript or parchment deed to which you can refer. I want to just say a word about um, Curzon. Some of you know that he was born at Kettleston Hall, which is here on the bottom. This is an image taken from the National Trust. Um, it's a country estate in Derbyshire. He was the oldest son and heir to the family estate. Kettleston, which is on the bottom, was built in 1765, was designed by Robert Adam, the architect whose studies in Italian architecture inspired a neoclassical revival in 18th century homes in England. 
patterned after Robert Adams designs for the facade of Kettleston Hall, you can see government house in Calcutta was built in 1803 to house the governor general, and then later the Viceroy of India and government house is, is shown here on the top in, um, in a photograph of 1921. Curzon was aware of this architectural duplication, considered a keen reader. He'd spent hours in the family's library reading about architecture and the works of figures such as John Ruskin and William Morris. He was deeply committed to preserving Britain's architectural heritage. One of the things I'll just say about these two buildings, um, <clears throat> which I hope will make sense later, is Kettleston Hall is a National Trust property. Um, it was made a National Trust property when Curzon died. When Kurz returned to England, he refurbished Kettleston Hall and then donated it to the government. When Curzon arrived in Calcutta to take up his position as Viceroy in January 1899, he knew of the duplication between these two buildings. And he had an agenda, which was to build new infrastructure and restore, old mon restore ancient monuments. In his vision of the ancient monuments, the ancient ruins um, belong to India, but these belong, buildings belong to the British. As several biographers have noted, he was an active and detail-oriented administrator whose supervision bordered on micromanagement. So for instance, in this house in Calcutta, he was responsible for installing electricity. And when he returned to Britain, he also installed electricity in Kettleston Hall. These visual echoes are very important to Curzon and it framed how he thought of the Victoria Memorial. In announcing the construction of a new building to commemorate the queen, one that rivaled the Taj Mahal in size, Curzon envisioned an architectural monument that would mark the permanence of British power in India, such as the Taj Mahal, which materialized the Mughal dynasty's presence. In opting for white stone for the Victoria Memorial, Curzon was conscious that the Victoria Memorial looked in shape and size like the Taj Mahal. Even as he imagined the construction of this new building, however, he committed to preserving India's ancient buildings and monuments. And so one of the main um, accomplishments of his time was that he reformed the Archaeological Survey of India and he, he passed important legislation on ancient monuments in India and their protection. Both of these campaigns, the campaign to build new monuments and upgrade them while protecting the ancient, generated a form of political legitimation that indexed Britain's civil civilizational superiority over its colonial subjects. I want to just share this image with you, and some of you um, may know a little bit about it, but I'll say more about it. Um, when Curzon revived the archeological survey of India, he knew that this was an organization which had been founded quite recently in the 1860s had fallen under some financial strain. It hadn't been fully supported by the government nor by local officials. With Curzon's strong recommendation, a new director general, John Marshall was appointed. John Marshall had been a classicist and an archeological um, researcher who had done excavations in Greece. Under Marshall's leadership, the ASI was reorganized and the central government consolidated the funding and oversight over local branches. Tabati Guha Takurta has written uh, really um, a nuanced account of this, so I won't say too much more. When Curzon announced what he wanted the ASI to do uh, in, at the Asiatic Society in Bengal, much to the same audience that he spoke to about Victoria Memorial, he wrote, quote, he regarded the conservation of ancient monuments as one of the primary obligations of government. Comparing India to Europe, where private wealth took up the task of conservation, in India, many ancient sites were on British territories. And so Curzon argued that the quote unquote peculiar responsibility of conservation lay with the government of India. Relying on these ideas of custody and obligation, Curzon argued that the protection of ancient ruins and artifacts aligned with an imperial commitment to protecting evidence of India's past, even as he affirmed repeatedly that India's ancient history was relatively recent, dating to the centuries after the origins of Europe. Curzon endorsed Britain's unique and privileged position, but he noted that the colonial government's record in protecting India's ancient monuments had been uneven, and he's particularly critical of the British military occupation of key buildings after the mutiny of 1857 
in particular Mobile Forts in Delhi, Agra, and Lahore, where in order to make room for military offices, marble walls were painted white, sandstone pillars were replaced with brick, and walls and fences were installed for security. Much of the jeweled inlay marble and granite had been looted by English visitors from these sites, and Curzon felt strongly that this felt reflected poorly on British occupation. In his time in India, he supervised the removal of these destructive changes, drawing from his knowledge and strong passion for Islamic architecture. He demanded the return of artifacts that had been stolen and sold to museums and dealers in Britain, and like he did in many of the homes that he lived in, he electrified the Taj Mahal and added electricity. He also did the same thing, I think, um, to the Red Fort. In 1904, after raising funds to restore Mughal monuments, the Taj Mahal, Humayun's tomb, as well as the Red Fort, Curzon put the Ancient Monuments Preservation Act before the Legislative Council. The provisions expanded from the Treasure Troves Act, which had been passed in India in 1888, to prevent the traffic of Indian antiquities outside of India. The, the 1904 Act rendered India's ancient ruins into protected monuments that required the colonial government's oversight. The registration specified which monuments and sites would fall under the government's purview. The legislation also provided that sites in use for religious purposes could be placed in the custody of local groups who required these buildings for religious or ritual purposes. The, the legislation that was passed at the same time in Britain in 1882 and 1913 uh, was different from the one in India in that in Britain it preserved uh, private property. In India, the list of protected monuments was on archaeological finds that were ancient. The fact that the colonial government established sovereignty or in the words of the legislation responsibility over heritage sites that predated the British occupation of India meant that many monuments installed during the British period did not fall under the terms of this legislation. So put another way, colonial monuments were never under the formal jurisdiction of the colonial, of the local governments, right? These legislation applied only to ancient ruins that had predated the British occupation. After 1947, when the British left India, this distinction became critical because statues installed by the British to commemorate various colonial historical events were not folded in to the oversight of the Archaeological Survey of India. This brings me to the Black Hole Monument, which is in front of you. Amid his campaigns for archaeological restoration and conservation, Curzon invested in commissioning, collecting, and restoring new monuments marking and making visible the British presence on the Indian subcontinent with marble and bronze statues that exhibited key figures and events. Curzon had a particular interest in the Black Hole incident, in, in an incident in which over 100 British men, women, and children had been imprisoned at Fort William, where the East India Company's armies were stationed. Tricked into surrender by the Nawab of Bengal's forces in 1756, the governor, John Zephaniah Holwell, was locked in a dungeon in the fort overnight, along with those he commanded. There's a lot of controversy around the Black Hole incident, its veracity, and so on. Two dozen people survived, including Holwell, and his account provided the British with the rationale to continue in their battle against the Nawab's armies. Robert Orme's history of this moment provided the reasoning for military intervention. Um, and the British occupation was a retribution for Siraj Udala's crimes against the British. Subsequently, the company's armies, under the command of Lord Robert Clive, defeated the Nawab's forces at the Battle of Plassey in 1757. So the Black Hole Monument is a very um, important historical monument in that it marks the origin for some of a British military escalation. When Curzon arrived in Calcutta in 1899, he noticed that the monument that had been installed in honor of Holwell in 1760 and the markers of the victims of the Black Hole incident were nowhere to be found. The monument had been removed in the 1820s and the site of the actual dungeon was unknown. With the support of local archeologists, Curzon identified the site of the original siege and excavated the site to find the grave markers of those who had been lost. With help from local historians, S.C. Hill, C.R. Wilson, and H.E. Busteed, Curzon sponsored the installation of a replica of the old memorial at Dalhousie Square, and this is the replica. 
He unveiled it on December 19, 1902. This monument was made of marble. The original had been made of brick. He argued that marble had a longevity. It could be more permanent than brick, which needed to be kept up. In his speech at the opening, Kurzman explained, quote, I determined to reproduce this memorial with as much fidelity as possible in white marble, to erect it on the same site and to present it as my personal gift to the city of Calcutta in memory of a never to be forgotten episode in her history and in honor of the brave men whose lifeblood had cemented the foundations of the British Empire in India. The so-called replica, however, was not exact and Curzon admitted that he'd made some material alterations. He changed Howell's inscriptions and added 20 more names to those who had not died at the Black Hole, but were pioneers of the British conquest as well. By correcting the historical record in this way, Curzon changed Howell's version of the Black Hole incident. As Partha Chatterjee has observed in a longer study of the Black Hole, it's a metaphor as well as a monument. As some of you likely know, this monument was vandalized in 1940 as a form of anti-colonial protest led by Shabash Chandra Bose. Prison's improvements for Calcutta involved making the city a repository. In this vision that he had, he argued that the history of India should begin with the Mughal dynasty and include those who had rivaled the Mughals, including the Marathas, the Sikh Confederacy, and the various princely successor states across Rajasthan, De the Deccan, and Southern India. He was faced with a great deal of opposition in building the memorial. And I do just wanna make clear that he knew that there was a great deal of opposition. And yet what he argued was that Calcutta had to be made as grand a city as London. He signaled to this, um, Memorial. This is the Memorial of Prince Albert, which is located in South Kensington, London. And he imagined that the Victoria Memorial would attract visitors to Calcutta as London had brought visitors in to see the Albert Memorial. I won't say too much about this um, memorial, except just to draw your attention um, to the four figures that bracket it. They represent uh, at, the, at the upper pedestal. They represent manufacture, commerce, agriculture, and engineering. And then you can also see that there are four images that represent the four continents, um, Europe, Asia, Africa, and America. And this became a key feature of a lot of the monumentalizing that Curzon imagined. In his appeal to the public for donations, Curzon focused on Indian princes and local elites and he invited them to donate from their private collections. This never actually came to pass, although there were some very generous monetary donations from the Maharaja of Kashmir, 15 lakhs, Maharaja of Sindhya, 10 lakhs, Maharaja of Jaipur, five, as well as donations from local coal companies, jute companies, the Zamindar of Patna, the Begum of Murshidabad, and other, other local notables who gave in the thousands. Beyond the materials that could be for, found among Indian private collectors, Curzon's list also included the many oil paintings and sculptures by British artists who were members of the Royal Academy that had been already exhibited in London. And I won't, I know I'm a little short of time, so I won't say too much more about that. Um, I do just want to say that one of the things that Curzon does in this moment in the first two decades, because remember he goes back to London in 1905. So from London, he gathers all of these materials that are already in India so that they can be put in the Victoria Memorial when the memorial opens. Curzon's activities in India in the realm of conservation and preservation are well known as was his love of pageantry. When he opened and organized the Darbar in Delhi in 1903, he sponsored two permanent memorials to Britain's victory over Indian soldiers. One was a monument to acknowledge the importance of those who'd been working in the Delhi Telegraph office in May of 1857. The one lone survivor of that attack was able to attend the unveiling of the monument. Another was this monument, which is to John Nicholson who died on the ridge in Delhi in 1857. The money was raised by somebody who was with John Nicholson when he died, Lord Roberts, 
And even though a tablet had long marked the place where John Mickelson had died in 1902, so almost at the 50th anniversary of the mutiny, Lord Frederick Roberts proposed that a proper statue be installed near Kashmiri Gate. This statue is finally installed in 1907 at the 50th anniversary. And it's built by Thomas Brock, who had um, also been involved in the designing of the Victoria Memorial. This statue, uh, another part of the project, but I'll forecast it, this statue was moved just 50 years later and reinstalled outside of Belfast, Ireland in 1957. In spite of Curzon's ability to transform bureaucracies, his vice regal reign was marked by a visible and dramatic failure. During his term as viceroy, he decided to partition the province of Bengal in into two administrative parts. He framed the decision as an administrative convenience, but many Bengalis, particularly those who had land holdings in Eastern Bengal, believe that the measure was an effort to divide the Hindu, Hindu majority population in Western Bengal from a Muslim majority population in Eastern Bengal and reduce their influence. The partition created a mass boycott of foreign made goods. Um, and when Curzon left at the end of 1905, the Victoria Memorial had yet to be built. I think this moment is critical, um, that in 1905, when Curzon is imagining the building of the Victoria Memorial, there are mass protests going on. As many of you know, the Sodeshi movement ends in 1911, and at the Imperial Darbar then, King George V announces that the capital would be moved from Calcutta to New Delhi, leaving the yet-to-be-built Victoria Memorial in a city that was no longer the capital of British India. When Curzon returned to Britain, he survived another two decades. And in that next two decades, I will say he was incredibly busy expanding Britain's national and imperial image. As David Gilmore, one of Curzon's many biographers noted, Curzon's non-political hours were largely absorbed by the commemoration of history and the restoration of ancient buildings. Um, just to give you a sense of Curzon's importance, this is a kind of early photoshopped image. It's a postcard from 1907. Uh, you see I've circled Curzon for you. I won't tell you who everybody else is, but to Curzon's left, seated in front of him is Winston Churchill. So it's, all, it's, it's a, a postcard that ties together several generations of empire builders and is aspirational in a sense, imagining that this empire is gonna continue for quite a bit longer. In his spare time, Curzon gave speeches, kept up a steady conference, uh, correspondence, and he restored a number of historic homes that then joined, um, the, that then were listed by the National Trust. And if you wanna ask me more about it, I can, um, I can say more. As anti-colonial resistance grew in the first decades of the 20th century, Curzon continued a steady campaign of promoting the historical achievements of the British Empire. As one scholar has, argued Curzon's projects were a form of elegy. He knew that the empire was in decline and that a permanent record of the empire in the form of monuments and statues would remain standing even when the British presence in India ended. In Britain, after the queen died in 1901, many towns and cities built memorials that marked her passing. Parliament convened a memorial committee to consider an adequate homage to the longest serving monarch who had reigned over the empire at its largest point. I'll show you probably the largest of these monuments, which is in front of Buckingham Palace. Thomas Brock, who is the sculptor of the John Nicholson statue, was chosen to design the British Memorial to the Queen. And here you see that the Queen is seated at the front of the statue looking, she looks down Pall Mall. Uh, the road was widened, um, the Admiralty Arch was built connecting Trafalgar Square to the road to Buckingham Palace. On the right, actually, I've given you the statue when it was first put up. The um, surrounding statues, the four statues were put up later. Um, in part, because Curzon had raised sufficient funds for memorials in India, the government of India made no contribution to the memorial in London. Instead, the Victoria Memorial in front of Buckingham Palace is flanked by gates on four sides that acknowledge the, British, the donations of the British colonies in Canada, Australia, Southern and Western Africa. At the same time as this memorial is being built in London, 
The construction of the memorial in Calcutta had stalled because Curzon had departed. A foundation stone was laid in 1906, but it's not until 1912 that the building structure was erected. From afar, Curzon remained active in managing what was going on. He insisted on visual conformities. And here I'll just show you the angel, the winged victory angel that is on top of the Victoria Memorial, which is similar to the winged victory here. Um, you can see here he commissioned from Frampton a seated image of the queen. And on the left um, is uh, the, the image in the studio in London. And on the right is the final statue in bronze that was put up in front of the Victoria Memorial. And there you can see it. You see the Victoria Memorial um, in the background. Victoria was amply represented uh, in the Victoria Memorial. Here you see her indoors uh, in marble, and this looks very much like uh, a statue that was um, made for, the, for Westminster Abbey. As Curzon developed the visual similarities between the memorials to Victoria in London and Calcutta, he campaigned for the installation of a statue to Lord Robert Clive in the center of London. And if you know your British history of India, you know that Clive was the adventurer and plunderer whose 18th century plunder of India had represented the East India Company uh, as this wealthy trove of treasure that he brought home to Britain. He died in 1774 uh, under investigation into his finances. Subsequently, the British Parliament passed two regulating acts. And when he died, he died with a, a sort of not very positive reputation. Curzon opted to, uh, wanted to campaign to rectify this. And so he insisted that a statue be installed to Clive. Lord Minto, who was Curzon's immediate successor as Viceroy, and John Marley, who was Secretary of State for India, opposed installing this statue here, fearing it would further inflame anti-colonial tensions that were already going on in India. Remember this Swadeshi movement was underway. Nonetheless, Curzon raised private funds to commission a statue of Clive by John Tweed, who was a member of the Royal Academy. The Clive statue was installed outside the Foreign Office in Whitehall in 1916, showing Clive standing with a sword in his left hand and a scroll in his right hand. I maybe won't say too much about the bronze statue on the left. The statue on the right is the same sculptor, but this time in marble. The statue on the right is located inside the Victoria Memorial. And the one thing I would draw your attention to is if you look at the statue on the left, which is in London, it has these bas reliefs that tell you the historical scenes that are of importance in Clive's life. Um, the victory at Plassey, the victory at the Battle of Arcot, and the accession to Diwani. Those historical accounts are not present in Calcutta, presumably because if you lived in India, you might not want to be reminded of these three battles. One might imagine that Curzon was an altruistic patron invested in reviving the reputations of monarchs and colonial officials with dubious credentials. But I do just want to point out that Curzon monumentalized himself a great deal. And so here is the statue of Curzon at the Victoria Memorial. And on the left, you can see a picture from 1921. On the right, you can see a more recent picture. Um, this is uh, probably the more modest uh, sculpture. This is the more grand one from Steggles and Barnes. And here you can see uh, Lord Curzon arrayed by the four figures as Prince Albert was. He wanted, he commissioned and raised the money for this statue to himself patterned after the statue that appears of the former prime minister in London on the strand, William Gladstone, which you have on the right, which has these four allegorical figures that represent um, different characteristics. Curzon's statue represent peace, agriculture, famine relief, and commerce. Um, this statue has been removed, and I'll just maybe show you where it is now. It's been replaced by Sri Aurobindo. So in closing, um, I want to turn to Curzon's defense of ancient monuments, such as the Taj Mahal, which aligned with his passion for installing new commemorative statues to historical figures who represented the victories of the British Empire. With these two passions in archaeology and history, he believed that history in its material forms should preserve for the future 
the history of the past. In India, his protection of ancient monuments focused on monuments that were constructed before the British occupation of India. All of the buildings that came under the ancient monuments legislation was then moved into protection as UN UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Many of these sites have, and I can say a little bit more about them. What is very clear is that the colonial monuments had no such legislative protection. And in that sense, it made it easier to remove those statues after India gained independence. In Alois Regal's terms, these statues jumbled these categories. These forms of value have been merged so that art and historical value are the same or collapsed into commemorative value. We can all agree that we have no use for monuments any longer. What we cannot agree is how to assess the historical value of these monuments. Regal's ideas may seem abstract, but in Curzon's time, ancient ruins were thought to have art value and use value and put under legal protection to protect them from being moved or sold uh, or des desecrated. The colonial statues had historical value and commemorative value. And so they were never covered by legislation. They were movable. And of course, many did move. I'll just end by saying that in post-colonial India, what's striking is that even though calls to remove monuments have emerged, few have actually been moved. Those installed by Curzon have been targeted for removal. The new Hol Holwell monument was removed as a series, as a result of a series of protests by followers of Shirbash Chandra Bose in 1940. The Nicholson Monument in Delhi was moved to 1957, and I could give you a few more examples. But monumental buildings such as the Victoria Memorial are much more difficult to remove, even though its construction coincided with a period of anti-colonial unrest and instability. In spite of the attention given to the removal of statues, in India, very few statues have been vandalized. Many have been moved, and in Calcutta, I would say most were removed in 1969 to Barrackpur or moved to the Victoria Memorial Gardens. Today, as we deliberate over what to do with monuments and statues to objectionable figures of the colonial past, the logics behind these genealogies, the preserving the ancient and celebrating the historical, have been conflated. Many defend, I think wrongly, the continued standing of monuments that are considered old or historical. I'll end by saying that Curzon, who was one of the most visible conservative politicians of his generation, would have been proud. So I think I'll stop share and then invite folks to ask questions. Um, 